Hello everyone, my name is Megan Wanless and I am a community animator at the Tamarack Institute. I'd like to welcome you to today's seminar, Developmental Evaluation, Principles and Practice, and also welcome our guests, Mark Kabaj and Michael Quinn Patton. Michael Quinn Patton has more than 45 years experience as an evaluator. His recent work has focused on developmental evaluation and principles-driven evaluation, both of which he pioneered, and are based on complexity theory and systems thinking. Michael is the author of several books, including Getting to Maybe, How the World has Changed, which he has co-authored with Francis Wesley and Brenda Zimmerman, and of course the new book, Developmental Exemplars, Principles into Practice. Mark Kobaj is president of the consulting company From Here to There and, a, and an associate of NAMRAC. Mark's current focus is on developing practical ways to understand, plan, and evaluate efforts to address complex issues. He has first-hand knowledge of using evaluation as a policymaker, philanthropist, and activist, and has played a big role in promoting the merging practice of developmental evaluation in Canada. Mark also co-authored a chapter to the new book. Thank you both so much for being here today. This webinar is part of an ongoing conversation we've been having with Michael and Mark here at Tamarack, in that this is the third time Michael and Mark have joined us for a webinar. I think the first was in 2010 and features Michael, featured Michael's first book. Those recordings are still available and we'll be sure to link you to them in the email that follows this webinar. We count ourselves very lucky to have the opportunity to welcome both of you again, Michael and Mark, to highlight the latest book and to share your iterative thinking on developmental evaluation. Mark, I'll lead it over to you to lead this conversation. Thanks, Megan, uh, and thanks to Tamarack for uh, creating a platform for chatting about this yet again. Uh, it's a real pleasure to continue the conversation, Michael. And with you, Mark. Thank you. Well, and uh, we've chatted a little bit about this. Uh, uh, we were excited when you said you were going to new a book, a new book, and so happy that it was released last week. I think it was was November 9th, the formal release date, Michael. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, and you're going to give us an update on how how uh, how people responded to it at the uh, American Evaluation Association meeting just last week. But we've got lots of questions, Mike. So let's, Michael, let's just jump right in. And let's start with the basic one, which will be a refresher for most of the people on the call, but it might be an introduction for a very few. What is developmental evaluation? Well, thank you. Uh, and my thanks to Tamarack as well, and to you, Mark, for uh, helping organize this. Developmental evaluation is uh, a particular niche and approach within the larger panorama of evaluation that focuses on uh, supporting the development of innovations, uh, new uh, program ideas, uh, new community initiatives, and providing timely information to help those initiatives and programs uh, adapt their innovation both to new learnings and to changing uh, context, changing situations, uh, the changing environment. So it's a process of using evaluation to develop innovations. So that, and this really, uh, the, the heart of the matter is that while evaluators may have been working in those contexts for many, many years, uh, uh, the field for the most part was dealing with the more traditional approach uh, to assessment that included formative assessment and summative evaluation. How do does it differ from these two evaluations, Michael? The, the big difference, and it's, and it's really important because there is a lot of misunderstanding about it, but the big difference is that, that we say evaluation grew up in the projects. It's a kind of project mentality. And a, a project is when, when traditional evaluation tends to ask the question, did it work? Did the project work? Did the program work? And the inference is, uh, the implication is, that there's an it, which is a stable, consistent, standardized way of doing something. And so traditional evaluation uh, renders a judgment about whether that it works. In a complex, dynamic, innovative kind of situation, the it itself is dynamic and adapting and changing. And so because of the project mentality, uh, traditional evaluations we're not able well to adjust to a dynamic and changing it. And that becomes the distinction and the distinctive approach of developmental evaluation is to treat the it itself um, as not an it, as uh, an evolving and adapting uh, and changing uh, thing. So 
So this, uh, you, you've said it a number of times, it's a, a purpose distinction. Uh, and one you know, that you've observed a number of times is important to keep in mind because the response to developmental evaluation with its emphasis on real-time learning and you know, good questions, et cetera, has been so, um, well, I wouldn't, well, in, in some cases, overwhelming, exuberant, that some people have said, look, I'm, I'm, I do developmental evaluation only, and, and most situations are developmental. But you, you, you made it a point to say that it does not uh, differ from, uh, it, it does not replace traditional evaluation. That's right. I mean, the, the question of whether or not a, a standardized uh, uh, program or project, uh, a, a model that people are using on a consistent basis, the, the question of how to improve that or whether that works and meets its goals is going to remain uh, the dominant feature of most evaluations. But the difficulty was that innovations were getting pushed into that slot and being treated as a, a static model rather than uh, having evaluation adapt to the dynamic uh, nature of innovation itself. And so it's no, but by no means going to replace uh, traditional evaluation or become uh, uniform or even dominant because the, the innovative niche uh, is a, a relatively small but important purpose, and that's where developmental evaluation fits. So to be good evaluators, one uh, we have to be situationally aware to match the the general approach to evaluation to the context or the nature of the intervention being assessed. That is the core. That is that is contingency thinking, situation responsiveness is is the core idea. There are there uh, in in the utilization focused book, I identify over 150 different evaluation approaches that have different kinds of focus, different purposes, uh, theory driven, empowerment. Uh, needs assessment, goal-oriented, and uh, developmental evaluation is one in that great panorama of evaluation options. Mm -hmm. And you, you've, you know, you've made it several times confirmed that it, therefore DE is a small but demanding niche, and, and maybe it's not small, but it certainly, uh, but it is a niche and it is demanding. But Michael, it is hardly, uh, you wrote the book in 2010, and I think your first, uh, time you wrote about DE was 1997 in an organizational development uh, magazine. Did, did the niche only appear in the 90s or what were we doing for, uh, for all those years when uh, evaluation emerged and uh, things were clearly developmental? How were we dealing with uh, developmental niches? Well, it's, a, it, it's, it's a great question and, and most of what was getting done is is the round peg in square holes. It was people being forced to because what evaluators knew how to do were standardized linear logic models uh, with predetermined, clear, specific, and measurable outcomes, and that was the expectation of funders. So innovation got put in that box. Uh, it got forced uh, out of the dynamic mode into a static uh, project model mentality mode. And it, uh, it was really through the work with, uh, with McConnell Foundation and, and uh, Francis Wesley and Brenda Zimmerman and, and the people in Canada who were working directly on innovation, who connected with me around developmental evaluation, and uh, that became the uh, enough people who understood it and were interested in it to begin to give it, it legs. And uh, it was really the Getting the Maybe book mentioned in the introduction that set the platform for my then writing the developmental evaluation book. And the, the first, so you, you did write a bit before in Getting to Maybe, you also wrote a number of, uh, in fact, I think the story is you wrote a chapter on it and then it ended up uh, DE being a footnote, one of the longest footnotes that one could put together. It's a six page, four, four or six font footnote because <laughs> the publisher, Random House Canada, uh, was worried that a chapter on evaluation would hurt sales of the book. And so, uh, we agreed that we would take that chapter out. Uh, I would turn it into a book on my own, but because DE was part of what we had been dealing with in the work on the book, it became that lengthy footnote. So a footnote turns into a book, thank goodness, and uh, it's one of the, the best evaluation books one could, one, one could purchase. I've been to colleagues' office and, and see it on their shelves or ratted uh, pa uh, pages uh, sitting on their desk. 
What does that 2010 book contain, Michael? Well, it, it laid out the first it emphasizes what the, what the niche is and why it's important, how it's different from formative and summative evaluation, um, and gives examples of actual developmental evaluations, um, lays out some of the, the methodological and framework options. So DE is not uh, a set of steps, it's not a set of methods, it's not a singular framework, it draws upon complexity and systems frameworks and and it uses any kind of, of methods and so the book gives a number of, of those kinds of, of examples um, and scenarios uh, uh, within which developmental evaluation uh, would take place. Um, since that time there has been a good bit of a pickup as you mentioned uh, last week was the annual meeting of the American Evaluation Association whose theme was evaluation exemplars and learning from success around the world. Um, and there were uh, a substantial number of sessions on developmental evaluation and I heard from people about developmental evaluation being mentioned uh, in many other sessions. And so it, it has become, in the years since the publication of the book, it has become a recognized area of, of, of practice uh, with a number of people engaging in it and reporting on it in the uh, not only the American Conference, but the Convention Association, Australasian, and conferences around the world. In this International Year of Evaluation, the United Nations designated 2015 as the International Year of Evaluation. The final event of this international year will take place in Kathmandu and Nepal in two weeks. Uh, and uh, the AEA meeting this past week was one of those, one of those year, year's events. Uh, where there's a lot of attention and interest in DE. That's, by the way, the way that practitioners tend to refer to it uh, as not developmental evaluation, but as DE. Yeah. Well, and, and Michael, there's so many now. I mean, if you uh, if you embrace this sort of dif diffusion theory of uh, of ideas, that there is, you know, untold numbers of innovators and would-be early adopters and a big crowd of uh, late adopters in the wings. Um, you that book you wrote so for five years ago had such such power such a, it seemed like the right book at the right time by the right person uh, and it was so comprehensive but you you felt it important you and Kate and Nan to write a new book five years later uh, why this book why now I appreciate that that question and and uh, once the once the earlier book was out. You know, the, uh, the thing that people kept asking time and time again were really two, two questions answered in the new book. Uh, one was, we want examples. Uh, we, need, we need examples of, of, uh, of what DE is in practice. What do actually developmental evaluations look like? Uh, more fully uh, done examples than I included out of my own practice in the original book, which were were short stories of my having done it, but people wanted more richness, no more the details, how some of the challenges were faced. And the second major question that emerged over time is a version of the fidelity question. What are the essential elements? Uh, what are the core principles of developmental evaluation? How does one really distinguish it from other forms of evaluation, the very conversation we've just been having? And so uh, I addressed the, the core question in a chapter on the essential principles of evaluation, uh, of developmental evaluation, and have a chapter answering the most common questions I get. But the heart of the book are 12 case studies of actual developmental evaluations uh, that, uh, that show a great variety of, of practice in different uh, kind of milieus and different kind of settings. Uh, and uh, be in part because of the International Year of Evaluation, um, the, the exemplars include examples from Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the Pacific Islands, and the United States. Uh, they also include an international agricultural initiative working in Africa and South America, a people-to-people -people reconciliation project with uh, 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 initiatives in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Burundi, and the Israeli West Bank Gaza uh, Strip and uh, a global partnership for the prevention of armed conflict working worldwide. We, we really tried to do a diversity of 
applications of developmental evaluation. And so the, the case examples include programs in sustainable agriculture, poverty reduction, education, community-based arts, supports to homeless youth, health care, uh, early childhood systems, access to college, preventing conflict, reconciliations of conflict, their local-based initiatives, programs in indigenous communities, national efforts at systems change, and a global network. The cases include innovations undertaken by philanthropic foundations, nonprofit agencies, international organizations, universities, community-based organizations, and government uh, reform initiatives. One developmental evaluation in the book has been going on for over a decade. Uh, another decade-long initiative has recently been completed with the developmental evaluation providing documentation for what happened and what was approved. Other examples are in midstream and still evolving. Uh, some examples have just recently been in completed. And one of the cases in the book was in its first year. So it's a wide variety of examples of uh, developmental evaluation practice that is, is recent and uh, quite diverse. Michael, was it um, was it difficult to find that variety, or did it when you uh, put out the feelers for the book was was that the kind of variety that came back at you? Um, the 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 difficulty was actually deciding the final group because we had a lot more to choose from, uh, as you know, because you are a part of the network of developmental evaluation practice in contact with each other. Um, we, through that network of, uh, of people doing it, we knew about uh, a number of different uh, applications. And, uh, and so we had a lot more possibilities than we could do. And so we went for diversity, uh, both internationally and, and subject matter-wise and focus and, and length of time. Um, and we went for one of, the, uh, one of the features of the way that we did the, the, the chapters was that because developmental evaluation is a collaborative action between evaluators and social innovators, people who are, are doing the, the innovative work. Every chapter is co-authored by an evaluator and a social innovation practitioner. So these aren't evaluator written case studies. They are collaboratively written, co-created chapters uh, by both the social innovator and the evaluator telling their story together. So one of the final uh, factors in in selecting cases was work that was far enough along and where people uh, had the capacity and the willingness to do that kind of writing together because mm -hmm. that it's not that it's hard but it takes time and and that accelerates uh, the intensity of engagement in telling that story together and our yeah. final cases are cases where people are willing to work that way together and co-author these chapters well, we're going to, uh, uh, we want to talk a little bit about what kind of themes emerge uh, for you, Kate and Ann, about those chapters. Two quick questions before we get there, uh, Michael. Uh, when you were putting together your, the first chapter, which was, you know, 10 common questions about DE, uh, I, I wrote in a book review, I thought that chapter alone was worth the price of the book. Do you, did, was this simply for you reaffirming that in 2010? Or do you feel that uh, something is new in your responses to those questions? Because really they form sort of the, the foundational ideas of DE. How much has emerged just on the things that you thought uh, were relatively, well, not relatively clear, but things, how you would have responded to those questions five years ago? So it's a great question. Uh, and I, I think that I would say uh, roughly half of it was repeating and clarifying and half of it was going deeper into those questions that have come out of working with practitioners and appreciating more the challenges that they faced, the things I hadn't made entirely clear, things that I, I hadn't thought of. Um, and so it was an, an opportunity to both uh, clarify some of the original notions, but also go, go more deeply into what, um, what we have learned in those five years. And, and we have learned a lot because the first book was based entirely on my own experiences and, and a few colleagues I knew had done a little bit, but now we have a repertoire of applications uh, from around the world and at different levels, and so I'm learning, and, and the things that I'm learning uh, are captured in that Q&A first chapter, but are also in, as you suggested, the, the theme chapter that Nan and, 
and Kate, my uh, co-editors from New Zealand, wrote. Yeah, that that's terrific. Well, once again, if, if one could only read the first chapter, that would be enough, but thankfully there's much more. Uh, before we get into these themes, Michael, just give us a little sense of Kate and Nan and uh, their role in editing uh, the book and why you chose to work with them. Uh, and let me add, Mark, that the first chapter is available online free on, at the Guilford website. So That's right. the book is published by Guilford Press, and if one goes there and simply puts in the name of the, the book or, or my name, uh, it will pull it up and people can read that first chapter. Um, in real time. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, Kate and Kate and Nan uh, have a uh, a partnership in evaluation in New Zealand, and New Zealand is one of the hotbeds uh, with Canada. Canada and New Zealand are the two places I think of as hotbeds for developmental evaluation. Uh, I have been working with um, Nan and uh, and Kate in New Zealand and some other New Zealand colleagues for about ten years. It was one of the first places I did a developmental evaluation workshop, and it seemed to really fit their cultural context um, uh, because they were not stuck, uh, for the most part, in the traditional notion of a, a, a consistent, stable it. They're very sensitive to context, both cultural context with the Maori people, uh, but in as an island nation, that is very much affected by what goes on around it in the world and in the southern hemisphere and, and the, the, the dynamics of being an island are really contextually sensitive, are, are, are hugely sensitive to how change in other places affects what goes on there. And so uh, uh, they just really resonated to the idea of uh, developmental evaluation as a complex dynamic system uh, form of evaluation because that's the nature of their world in in New Zealand and uh, and because of of um, their being very active in the developmental evaluation network and especially around issues of adapting it to cultural responsive and indigenous context they were um, have been great collaborators uh, could not have done the book without them and their outreach and in fact they they were the ones who who uh, initially uh, insisted that the chapters be co-written between evaluators and practitioners because they wanted to emphasize that that is a core element of developmental evaluation. Well, and Michael, their summary chapter is just a pleasure to read as well. And so I can imagine how much fun it was for you and Kate and Nan to look at uh, you know these final 12 candidates for the, the chapters and then try and make sense of it all. Uh, there's so much to say about this, but when you when you all looked at the, the the dozen case studies, what were some of the most significant insights or learning uh, that popped out for you, and why did you feel they were significant? One of the things that uh, that Nan and Kate really pulled out of of the uh, cross cross case analysis was the importance, uh, first of all, of organizational match, of organizational readiness that that uh, there really is uh, a need for the organization to be sure that they're prepared to deal with complexity, the dynamics of change, uh, that they're open-minded uh, about a different way to go about evaluation, uh, that they're prepared to deal with ambiguity. There's a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity. Uh, the design uh, of developmental evaluation is often emergent. It's not fixed and known at the beginning. Outcomes can emerge. And so they, um, they looked a lot at readiness. I should mention, by the way, Mark, that not, not all the cases in the book are great successes. There are a couple cases where people really struggled. In all the cases, there was some degree of challenge and struggle around this very issue of, of the, the innovative nature of developmental evaluation itself and the huge, uh, the huge imposition of a traditional way of thinking about evaluation that organizations kept defaulting into. So, so a second theme uh, was once an organization begins doing uh, and, and being engaged in uh, developmental evaluation or an initiative or a program or a funder in particular is staying the course because we found uh, that there often was a lot of interest at the beginning and it seemed to fit and people understood that there was an innovation, but then they get going and begin to default to traditional evaluation thinking and begin to say, so 
when will you have a final report that says whether or not this worked and uh, and defaulting to a kind of traditional mindset. So the theme of, of ongoing explanation, ongoing commitment, of reiterating purpose uh, and bringing people along and staying the course uh, was uh, a major kind of, um, mm -hmm. of theme. And then a, a third one uh, was wrapped up in those two is is continuing challenge of dealing with ambiguity, uncertainty, unknowability. The the we've learned that that our traditional planning and evaluation models are hugely control oriented. The, and the pretense that we know what's going on and can predict and control what's going on. And a lot of organizational program structure is aimed at and based on that assumption. So dealing with ambiguity and, and with unknowability and emergence, um, nonlinearity, core, uh, core complexity concepts, adaptability, these are challenges for folks to get their heads around both on the innovative side and the evaluation side. And so those are not things you just agree to at the beginning and then it's a done deal. Um, there is some initial of getting into the mindset of developmental evaluation, but there's ongoing nurturing around these core concepts. It doesn't just happen once. It has to happen all the way through. Well, Michael, do you think, given some of the questions I'm sure are going to be around readiness, that, that it's uh, appropriate at the beginning of a possible developmental evaluation adventure to say, look, I don't think the conditions are ready and here's the reasons why, and even more uh, tough to deal with, in the middle of an, uh, 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 an evaluation to say, look, I don't think the conditions have sustained themselves. It doesn't seem like we're ready for this and to, to exit the process. Does that, that sounds, it's even hard to say. Can, can you imagine it happening or seeing it happening or do you think it would be appropriate for that? Uh, we, we do have examples of that. And of course, part of the difficulty at the front end is, is people knowing what they're committing to when they haven't done it before. Right. Uh, and, and so we've, we've used in some ways the, the metaphor of a dating relationship where, you know, a, a couple is getting to know each other. And, and so it's, it's pretty hard at the beginning of a dating relationship to make a commitment. I mean, that's the purpose of dating is to figure out do we want to make a commitment. So, but what that's meant then is, is where it's really new and where it may be problematic is for uh, people to, to build in that they would get started with it and as it emerges what it is to build in time to reflect is uh, do we want to stay the course with this? Is it is it doing what we need to be done? Not just treat it as a, a three-year commitment at the front end, but to say, well, let's let's do six months of this uh, and, and then come together and look at what's developed and look at what the contribution is and look at what the next six months may look like and see if it still makes sense. So the evaluation and the relationship of the evaluation with the practitioners and with the funders is in development itself, is co-evolving and co-creating and needs to be checked in on and, and looked at with, with the understanding that if it's not working, um, we may need to default back to something else. Yeah, yeah. Michael, it's, uh, boy, the, the urge to go through all of this. Uh, and what's so great about developmental evaluation and the way you've positioned it is, is that it's generative. Each question response uh, kind of uh, creates an urge to go deeper and keep, continue to peel away the onion. It just, it, it's forever self-refueling, this conversation. Uh, when, uh, but with all these possibilities and these questions uh, uh, and the need to be thoughtful around almost every part of the developmental evaluation uh, journey, some people still come to you and say, look, I get all that, I buy into DE, I like these case studies, but what are the methods of DE? And you uh, reaffirm once again at the end of this book that there might be some common concepts, some common framing, uh, and but methods are highly situational. The real thing to think about around the container for DE is perhaps being uh, navigating uh, developmental evaluation guided by a number of principles. And You've mentioned your last chapter is focused on principles. Uh, can you just share why principles uh, and not more than that, and perhaps uh, give us a sample of one or two of the principles that you found um, um, you find most useful in DE? So it's a really core question, and this is one of the big things 
that I and colleagues have learned, and uh, including long discussions with you, Mark, about making sense of this, is that the developmental evaluation niche is in strong contrast to this very popular uh, language of best practices. And the very language of best practices is context-free. It suggests that whatever the God, God identified as the best practice can be done anywhere without regard to best. There doesn't have to be contextual adaptation. And that once you've nailed best, then you've got it. And you just keep doing that. Well, that doesn't fit very well with the real world of, of dynamism and complexity. and so. Best practices are recipes. They, they say do exactly this. And the form of evaluation that accompanies implementation of best practices is called fidelity evaluation, where the evaluators become the fidelity police to make sure that as a uh, program or an initiative is, t is taken to scale, is spread around the world, that it's done exactly the way it was originally uh, developed and generated and summatively tested that that model, the best practice model, which is sometimes trademarked and, and codified, is done exactly the same way in new settings, much like everybody uh, expects to get the same McDonald's hamburger anywhere in the world. And McDonald's polices that and makes sure that if you go anywhere in the world, you get your McDonald's burger. Um, well, that way of thinking is actually the dominant form of traditional evaluation. In, uh, Principles, in contrast, provide guidance. They provide direction. They are both empirically based and values based, but they don't tell you exactly what to do. You have to apply a principle in context. So in a recipe sense, a rule is add a teaspoon of salt or a quarter teaspoon of salt to the recipe. That's a recipe. Do it that way. If you want to get the, the, the result that the chef has uh, determined is correct, you add these ingredients in exactly this way and cook it for this amount of time. A principle, in contrast, is season to taste. Season to taste means you look at, at your own uh, desires and tastes. You look at who else you're serving, uh, whether salt is an issue for them in their diet, what is appropriate for the occasion. Uh, do you let people season themselves instead of seasoning in the kitchen? And that's a more uh, metaphor for a, a, a principle uh, approach. Um, Utilization-focused evaluation itself is a, is a good example. So utilization-focused evaluation says specify intended uses, uh, intended users, who's going to use the evaluation, what are they going to use it for, and engage with them. And I get calls and emails asking me, how many intended users should I have? Um, mm -hmm. Well, it's a principle. What, what you should do is identify them. It's contextual. There can be one. There can be many. Um, how many depends upon the situation. Identifying intended users and working with them is a principle. It's not a narrow best practice. It's not highly prescribed. So developmental evaluation then is principles-based. There, We've also found that there are principles-based programs that are operating contextually in different places. Um, and the work that, that you did in, in across Canada, vibrant communities, is an example of a principles-based initiative where people agreed to a set of principles and then adapted those to different communities. So developmental evaluation is also principles-based and is especially appropriate for principles-focused programs and initiatives. Mm -hmm. And Michael, the, the, eight you, um, the eight you came up with, um, uh, we won't ask you to work th through each of them now, but those, those, those in some ways are sort of the uh, the container around which uh, most uh, developmental evaluations could be uh, organized or at least navigated. Do you feel that's a li uh, eight that this is what we can see so far, but there's probably more, or are you feeling no? That sounds like that. Uh, you feel pretty confident about those eight. That if we wrote a book in five years, that uh, there wouldn't be another four. It's a great question, and um, as you know, Mark, because you were one of the major people I was dialoguing with about this chapter um, because of your extensive practice, the principles are really uh, based upon the interactions among a group of us who are doing developmental evaluation about what we collectively experienced as core. So it wasn't my sitting back and thinking about what the core was, but it was working with you and, and some other colleagues on what 
the translation questions you were running into. Uh, and so, for example, one of the, the principles, the second principle, is we call the evaluation rigor principle, um, which, which says that the, 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 the developmental evaluation involves asking probing evaluation questions, thinking engaging evaluatively, questioning assumptions, applying evaluation logic, using appropriate methods, and staying empirically grounded. That is rigorously gather, interpret, and report data. That, that principle seems yeah. obvious if you're calling something an evaluation, but we kept hearing from practitioners that people were treating this like a facilitation technique where people just get together and think about stuff and not gather data. That, yeah. that, that they weren't, they were calling something DE without data. So that principle is there to say, look folks, this is evaluation. It's, it's not a communications OD process, organizational development. It's evaluation, and it's evaluation done with some rigor. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's utilization focused. Uh, it has a developmental purpose. Uh, and so we, we felt a need to articulate those. I, I don't know if, if the list might grow. It, it might well. But because it's so practitioner based uh, and, and trying to, to say what the core is, that um, uh, I think this may have some staying power. Yeah. Michael, you uh, <coughs> created a um, you created a new pathway for evaluation uh, and, and shaped it greatly with the, the book in 2010. And you, Kate and Nan, have created a new book that does simply terrific framing on DE. Uh, I, I find it. Uh, uh, again, worth the price of the book. Uh, that alone, I, I've shared with people now, and uh, uh, it's resonant with them. The patterns of practice, other case studies beyond your own, uh, have been super helpful. And these eight principles, yeah, they may evolve over time, but boy, if they don't, I'd be happy with the eight. So I, we owe you a big uh, thank you for for creating another milestone in this adventure called developmental evaluation. But you think a lot about these things, and uh, I'm wondering if we could ask you to guess a little bit about what the um, uh, the next iteration of developmental evaluation might be. If you're looking at it from uh, the next book five years from now, what are the kinds of things on your mind? What are the kinds of things that you were working on that are related to DE that we might see in a book? Well, the, uh, the, the current book I'm working on is principles-focused evaluation and programming and really going more deeply into the very nature of evaluating principles, treating principles as the thing evaluated. Uh, are, it involves both implementation and outcomes. With principles, the, the implementation question is the walking the talk question. People articulate principles. Do they actually guide their practice? Can you connect the dots between what's done and, and the principles, and then uh, principles also point to results. Uh, what kind of, of results? So in developmental evaluation, the ultimate test is that something's getting developed, uh, and that learning is going on in support of that development, and that things are, are being adapted uh, in ways that, that uh, uh, help uh, in, increase effectiveness and, and, uh, and utility and, and meaningfulness. So um, one, of the, one of the pushbacks that that's coming from the principles focus is that it sounds to people like it's all process. But in fact, a principles focused approach uh, is, is quite results oriented. Uh, those principles lead to, to results and not only uh, a process. So I'm, I'm going to be writing about that and exploring the connection between principles focused programs and initiatives like the ones you've been involved in and that others uh, in our network have been involved in and the way in which you engage with developmental evaluation uh, we, we all engage with it as a principles-based approach, not a best practices or highly prescriptive approach. Um, the other thing that, uh, uh, that I'm very um, uh, enthusiastic about, having just come from the, the American Evaluation Association meetings and this International Year of Evaluation, is, uh, is seeing uh, the evolution of a new niche in the evaluation uh, uh, universe of what I'm calling global systems evaluation or blue marble evaluators, which looks at uh, evaluations of initiatives that are taking a, a truly global perspective. 
the International Year of Evaluation has been focused a lot on the Millennium Development Goals and building national evaluation capacity. There are over, well over 100 national evaluation associations now, but uh, the designation of 2015 is the International Year of Evaluation by the United Nations has been focused largely on nation state capacity. And there's a, a off-sided quotation from Albert Einstein that you can't solve problems at the same levels at which they've been created. So in our changing world, part of the global development is our interconnectedness as a human family in around things like climate change, uh, the economic interdependence of our world, uh, global terrorism, the horrible events that have just happened this week, more bombings, not only in France, but, but in Beirut and, and in, still in Baghdad. Um, these are the, the, the global migration of people. There are more people who are homeless and just uh, out uh, trying to find a place migrating than any time since World War II. Uh, public health has become a global issue, the spread of virulent diseases. Uh, and so when we look down through the list of, of issues, they transcend national borders. Uh, and so the next stage of development of the profession, of which I would hope developmental evaluation would contribute, because global issues are going to be complex and dynamic, is a developmental kind of mindset at the globe level, uh, at the, 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 the transcends national borders that we're calling blue marble evaluation because of the space shot from space that mm -hmm. showed the Earth without national boundaries, and that's where I'll be putting a lot of energy in uh, in supporting development of a global systems change evaluation based on developmental evaluation understandings and principles. Michael, we hope that won't be five years. See if you can uh, pump up that book sooner. <laughs> I will be uh, doing the first course on that in Ottawa at the International Development Program Training uh, uh, Institute in uh, in June, so something will be there, and that's how I get books written. I do workshops on them first, learn from people uh, how to address issues, and then I'm ready to do the book. So uh, that will be taking place in Ottawa next June. Well, when we do the follow-up, we'll see if we can send uh, some kind of information to people about that on the off chance that they can register. Okay. Uh, Michael, this we we for sure uh, we spent a little bit more time chatting part, uh, about this than anticipated, partly because the the content is, uh, is there's so much to get into. Well, we do have some nice questions from the audience, so I'll say thanks to you for this uh, after the questions uh, uh, come in. Uh, let me go through a couple here that I don't think we, uh, we would have touched on directly in your conversation. Some of the questions you have, but here are some for sure that that have not. And this one you're quite familiar with by now, Michael. The, this popped up just recently on the screen. What might convince a funder that developmental evaluation is worth it? Well, I think it begins with what the funder is trying to fund. And so because of the innovative niche, uh, it's, a, it's a question of, of whether the funder is really uh, uh, supporting innovation. There are, and, and this is always a question, I mean, there are forms of what's called innovation. Indeed, the, the White House initiative on innovation is, in my mind, not innovative at all because what it's doing is taking um, summatively evaluated uh, randomized controlled trial results of programs and supporting the spread of those as best practices. So yeah. the, the, the first thing is to find out if, if we're talking about innovation in the way that, that we've been discussing it here and that the the funder understands the implications of innovation and of operating innovations in a complex dynamic space. So it's not, it's not beginning by trying to, to see is developmental evaluation appropriate. It begins by saying, what, is your, what, what, what are you funding that you think is innovative? What's the space within which that's happening? What's your view of complexity? How do you think about systems change? And if all of those things line up in the way that that they are attuned with developmental evaluation, then you say, well, here's an evaluation approach that, that meshes with that. But you don't begin with the DE, you begin with the initiative that's getting funded. Yeah. Terrific. Michael, first rate. Uh, uh, and that, uh, that response may not just be for funders, that might be also for anyone leading a change process. Funders may ask that, but so might be 
or big organizations where the leadership is somewhat removed from the the innovation process. That's right. Yeah. So the, the you know one of the indicators that D may be appropriate is people are saying we understand that we don't have solutions to existing problems. We see a need for innovation. We want to try things out. This is an unknown territory. Well. To explore that, don't let that stay at the surface. Find out if that's real, what they people understand the implications of that to be, um, and if it's if it's real, a traditional approach to evaluation won't be helpful because it will put it into a static box. Yeah, yeah. Michael, the, the the next question is something you've touched on before, but it comes up a lot, I find, when people are talking to me, and it really refers to this distinction between organizational development and leadership and the evaluation of the development process. So. Um, Petra asks, can you comment on using DE as a lens through which you practice uh, more generally every day, i.e. leading an organization or offering coordination to a large, complex, and emergent collective impact process? She asks, would you still call this DE? It's a, it's a great question, and, and it's, it's highly contextual. So. Um, there is an, I, I, I bear the burden of having been trained in, in sociology and organizational sociology. And organizational uh, sociology makes a distinction about different kinds of, of organizations that are involved in different kinds of challenges. So more mechanical manufacturing organizations have a lot of routines and depend upon routines. Uh, nuclear power plants uh, operate on routines. People don't come to work every day and make it up. So what, what, how do we think we ought to monitor nuclear power today and see what's working? No, you, you want a stable process there. You want, you want good, regular, standardized, predetermined uh, metrics, and you want to stay on top of those, and it's rigid and it's disciplined. That's not a developmental evaluation kind of situation. But there are other organizations where uh, the things are highly adaptive, where you're, you're trying things out, where you're being called on dealing with, with situations daily. So for example, folks that are epidemiologists and they're tracking the emergence of diseases and, and having to see where there are outbreaks and how many people are getting uh, the needed vaccinations and are we reaching thresholds of people resisting vaccinations and, and, and understandings about the nature of vaccinations and what's going on in different parts of the world and how is disease spreading and why are there new outbreaks of polio. Well, that's an environment that is dynamic. Staff have to be responsive able to respond quickly. One of the places where developmental evaluation has been uptaked are, are humanitarian organizations dealing with, with environmental and humanitarian crises. Those are inherently uh, uh, volatile environments and they need an evaluation approach that, that matches that. To the extent that, that the organizational nature or at least some units within the organization are dealing with a great deal of uncertainty and changing roles and changing uh, responsibilities and, and new challenges, DE would fit on a more ongoing basis. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's the match that, that you look for. There's nothing inherently good about DE. There's nothing that makes it uh, meaningful or, or appropriate. It, it is a match to this kind of, of complex dynamic situation. Uh, it offers an alternative for that. And if that fits your organizational culture, then you can do it on an ongoing basis. Yeah. And Michael, even within that, could you help again the distinction between organizational development in those kinds of contexts and the evaluative dimension in, in those spaces? It, what's the difference between those two? Well, I don't want to create too broad a brush, but a lot of OD, not all of it, and, and communications facilitation and, and some other kinds of program development and staff development techniques largely involve uh, people sitting around and sharing ideas, going through processes of, um, of uh, uh, agreeing on things, uh, of running scenarios with each other about how they might do something differently, of sharing their perceptions about uh, what, what's happened, um, and, but don't involve any real data, so that, that don't involve getting feedback from, from intended beneficiaries or participants in programs or doing a systematic environmental scanning and bringing that data into the discussion or looking at what's actually getting achieved, what are the interim outcomes or short-term outcomes, what are responses. And so um, a lot of OD, very valuable OD, is, is helping get people in the organization on the same page. 
So one form of, of programmatic OD uh, that's quite common, or programmatic development, is evaluators helping people develop a logic model and get yeah. everybody on the same page and using the same language. That's an important function, but it's not data-based. Um, and so the, the reason that evaluation rigor is one of the principles is be sure that you're talking about data. You're not just uh, talking about each other's perceptions and not just getting everybody on the same language page. It's about, it's about having an empirical basis for developing. Yeah. Yeah, and my, I, thanks for revisiting that, Michael. You do a real good job in the first book, and I think you touch on it in this book again, but that is a, a common question. Let's, uh, we have a time for a couple more quick ones. Let's, uh, uh, let me ask uh, this one about uh, the role of team and roles and responsibilities in DE. You often make the distinction, I think you did in the first book, that DE is a developmental evaluation, not really a person, but it's a function uh, that's embedded in the, the, the team's work. Uh, can you, uh, the, the actual question, what are the roles and responsibilities for a team in this form of evaluation? Well, as you've emphasized in our discussion, the developmental evaluation is a purpose distinction. It's not a, it's not a method or a set of prescriptive steps or, or an allocation of, of particular um, ways of, of doing something. Nan and Kate are uh, great exemplars of working in teams in the New Zealand context. They have a collaboration. Uh, virtually everything they do is done as teams and uh, typically in a, in a collaboration with practitioners. And, and so the team becomes not just the evaluation team, but it becomes an innovation team. And the developmental evaluators are part of the innovation team, of whether it's called a design team, uh, an initiative team, an implementation team. The developmental evaluator is embedded in the innovative uh, process. So as with any team, I don't think the team dynamics are particularly different. You want to know what each team, team member brings to the process, uh, the strengths and, and weaknesses, and, and how those team strengths and weaknesses coalesce. The thing that developmental evaluation would add systematically to the team process is attention to evaluating how well the team is working because teams have to get developed and teams are dynamic and they face new challenges and, and there will be nonlinearities, there will be emergence, there will be things that occur that challenge the operations of the team. There will be power dynamics and communications challenges. And so developmental evaluation can actually be an internal form of ongoing team uh, learning and team management uh, and team development, even as the team is a part of a larger developmental evaluation process. Yeah, uh, excellent, Michael. Boy, the the questions are coming fast and furious now. My, uh, let me do, let, Michael. Let's see if we can do three questions in three minutes. <laughs> I don't know. Right. If it's possible. I'll keep it short. Well, no, this is uh, well. This is, well, it'll be fun as much as anything. Uh, what is the relationship between developmental evaluation and utilization-focused evaluation? Uh, utilization-focused evaluation is the overall umbrella. Developmental yeah. evaluation emerged in my working with a specific client who needed something I didn't at that point have to offer. It's the story that opened the original book. And so, uh, but all developmental evaluation, in fact, one of the principles, as you know, Mark, one of the eight principles is utilization focused. Know who it's for, be sure that you're fulfilling the developmental evaluation purpose. Yeah, terrific. Uh, and by the way, uh, David Plouffe asked a question about the relationship to human-centered design. We don't have to go into it, uh, uh, Michael, but I, I would say that's the, the same answer to the design-oriented question. Uh, here's another good one. Does developmental evaluation need to be built into a program from the start, or can it be introduced at a later date? Uh, it is introduced at a later date sometimes. There are examples of that in the, in the cases. Um, and, and some of that is, is because the readiness wasn't there at the beginning, and people were trying some traditional stuff. So it's a matter of, of a fit. It's not like the, 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 the barn door is uh, closed and you can't get, get it open again. Um, by all means, uh, it, you, you simply have to adjust and adapt for whatever the new baseline is, what, what those conditions are, and that will uh, uh, require some adjusting both for the evaluation and for the, the practitioners. But uh, it, I've seen it brought in near the end to interpret what's gone on and to, to look back 
is what we call retrospective developmental evaluation that's actually done at the end and looks back and realizes that there was a developmental story that wasn't getting captured in real time along the way, but now at the end needs to be revisited and made sense. The sense making is a retrospective developmental evaluation. Yeah, excellent, Michael. <laughs> Uh, this is good. I hope you're having fun. <laughs> I'm having fun uh, just reading how fast these things are coming in and listening to you respond like a, a batter in a batter cage. Uh, this one is uh, probably a question from um, that 80% of the folks on the line you know, have had at one point in their lives. Uh, how can a practitioner beef up their credentials uh, in DE to help assure potential partners about their capabilities? And maybe, Michael, this is just a broader question about uh, the capabilities of the evaluators that you that you touch on extensively in the book. Yeah, the yeah. Uh, the the credentialing thing is going to be an interaction around a fitting that, that the evaluator has either the direct competences or a network of people to draw on to have a, a large tool repertoire of methods repertoire. Uh, that the, the evaluator can think in contingency terms, has good personal interaction capability, uh, can, can facilitate a group, can, can quickly make sense of things, um, has street smarts. And so uh, it's, it's, again, it's a, a big part of it is a matter of match that the developmental evaluator uh, in, in personal style and characteristics and knowledge is a good match for the, the practitioner. That's the dating relationship. And they, they may need some time to sort that out and, and, uh, and test it out and uh, see if, if, in fact, it's, it's a good match. Uh, uh, so I would say that's true about traditional evaluation as well. But the contracts are more fixed and the, the capabilities are more known. So uh, it's a matter of people uh, trying it out. It, trust is a central issue in developmental evaluation. The, yep. the innovators and the evaluators have to trust each other, and 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 that becomes a basis for for real time and meaningful and tough feedback. Uh, that that itself has to get developed. And again, Michael, that you, you touched on that so nicely. And for those who want more on how do I beef up my capabilities in DE in general, you've got a marvelous section in the book on that. So thanks for that. Hey, we are at time, uh, unbelievably. Uh, so we we walked through a bunch of basic questions today about the foundations of DE, and you gave us uh, a bunch of very nice glimpses into what the book. You know, it's it's just abundantly clear. This is an extraordinarily important contribution to anyone who's interested in wedding evaluation to the real world challenge of solving complex issues and coming up with novel ways that may or may not work. So Michael, thank you for the book. Thank you for participating in the session and thanks for being so lucid on so many rapid fire questions. You know how much uh, how important you are to us and uh, the fact that you do you're so generous in doing it, it uh, makes it a double gift. So thank you so much. And and thank you Mark and let me add one other quick resource to follow up with. Um, that's not in the book, the, the case of developmental evaluation that you and I were involved in together that is written up as a major case uh, is available for people at the Center for Evaluation Innovation. Perhaps that link can be sent out to people. Uh, it's a great case study of some of these challenges of doing developmental evaluation and matching to the situation. That case is available free to people, tremendous case job and uh, we'll connect them. You ought to also, people ought to be connected to your evaluation reports and evaluate in vibrant communities as an example of a, of, of a huge developmental evaluation that... Over to you, Megan. Okay, I'd like to just echo our thanks to you, Michael and Mark, for joining us today, and also to everybody who had such thoughtful questions. It really made it more rich and deep, so thank you so much. In a few days, uh, we will email you with the links to the audio and other material related to today's call, um, so please feel free to email tamarack at tamarackcommunity.ca to let us know what you thought of today's broadcast. Um, if you enjoyed today's conversation and are interested in capturing and making sense of community outcomes, we invite you to consider joining us next February for Evaluating Community Impact. This three-day learning event featuring Mark and Tamara Axelis Weaver is designed for people like you who are eager to tackle the challenging but critical task of getting feedback on local efforts to change communities. 
We also have some fantastic webinars coming up before then, uh, including a conversation on December 3rd between Karen Pittman, co-founder and president of the Forum for Youth Investment, and Alex Bazina, De Deputy Minister of the Ontario Government's Ministry of Children and Youth Services. The webinar entitled Youth Readiness, Mobilizing for Impact, promises to be an animated conversation between Karen and Alex, who both care deeply about youth and are advocates for collective impact. Also, tomorrow, the first, uh, our first ever six-part book in our series with Al at Mansky begins. This is the first time we've hosted a book club webinar series, and it focuses on the question of, why do some social innovations take hold while others fail to spread as far and wide as they should? Al at Mansky will interview six social innovators over the course of the series, and registrants for each webinar will receive a free copy of Al's book. You can get more information on these and other learning events on our website at www.tamaraccommunity.ca. I will leave you with that. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.